Holy Spirit, you are referred to in Scripture in both the Old and New Testaments as the breath of God. Um, what a wonderful picture. That very at the very beginning of creation, uh, the Father crafted Adam out of dirt and breathed into him. And Adam became a living person. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would breathe into us today, that you would bring us to life today in a new and fresh way, that we would hear the word of God, that we would be swept along by you, the wind of God, to go where the Father and the Son and you are leading and guiding and directing. Help us to cooperate with that purpose, Lord. And if there's anything that's merely human in here that would anchor us to a place that we don't want to be, that would cause us to drag our feet, we pray, Lord, that we would let go of our sin and every weight that so easily entangles us and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, like many people in my generation, I grew up with the 1965 Peanuts Christmas special. Anyone else? Big favorite? I think one of the most impactful minutes ever on broadcast television is when Linus recites Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12 when he explains to Charlie Brown what is the real meaning of Christmas. Like millions of other people in my generation, I was exposed to the core content of the gospel repeatedly, at least once a year growing up, because they showed that special over and over and over again. As an adult, it hits different. In fact, I was, I was reviewing it for this sermon and noticed something in the clip that I'd never noticed before. As Linus is reciting, he gets to the phrase in verse 10, fear not. But an angel said to them, fear not. And he drops his blanket. I don't know if that means much to you. I, I loved peanuts growing up. And Linus always, always carried his security blanket with him. You just didn't see Linus without his blanket. But in this particular case, as he says the words, fear not, he lets his security blanket fall to the ground because he is completely secure when he's reciting words from Scripture. What a great response to the gospel. And it makes me wonder, how do we respond to Jesus' birth? We're going to be looking at this particular passage from Luke chapter 2. We'll read from 1 to 14, but we're also going to look at 25 to 35 just to get a slightly different perspective about how different people responded to Jesus' birth. This is on page 1590 in your pew Bible. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 14, page 1590 in your pew Bible. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So... Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, when the time came for the baby to be born, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. I think 
grappling with the question of how people respond to Jesus' birth is important. Because we see here how heaven itself responds. We see heaven's example. In verses 1 through 7, we see heaven's plan, the choice that God had made from before time began as to how he was going to rescue humanity. Let's take a minute to consider the big picture. I talked last week about how we all have free will, how Mary exercised her free will by saying yes to God. Now, some people in Christendom disagree with that. They don't believe we have free will. They think that we're moved around like chess pieces. That all of our life is predetermined and that God is controlling every single choice that we make. I don't agree with that. I don't think that's right. And the reason why I don't think that's right is because love needs response. Here's what I mean. God is love. He didn't make us just because he was bored. He didn't make us to show us that he was super creative. He made us because he loves us. He spoke us all into being because he is love. He loves us. And yet, here's the point. He wants us to love him back. If God dictates all our choices, if God creates everyone to do exactly what he wants and nothing else, if we were created to love God and not to have a choice not to love him, then it's not love. It's a programmed response. It couldn't be actual love because there's no option not to love. Forced love isn't love. So God, in creating us, had to set up a situation where some people would have the absolute and free choice not to love him in response. That's what makes love, love. God says he has a plan. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. This action right here in Luke chapter 2 is the linchpin of God's plan for humanity to fix our brokenness. God moves his people, Joseph and Mary, to be in the right place at the right time. He moves them to Bethlehem, as was spoken in the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small in the clan of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He went there, Joseph, went to Bethlehem to register with Mary. Mary was expecting a child, and this happened in a very specific time in history. Look back at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. This is the first census that took place when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And verse 7 states, She gave birth to a firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, the means by which everything that was created came into being. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, things created for him and by him. The master lens, the creator, the logos of the universe becomes the lowliest of the low. A baby to a poor family who's in such dire straits, the baby isn't placed in a cradle, he's placed in a feeding trough. That's heaven's plan. Now look at verses 8 and 9. We see heaven's witnesses talking about the shepherds. Of course, there were shepherds in the fields nearby watching their flocks by night. They are minding their business. They're, they're, they're minding their sheep. And suddenly an angel shows up glowing bright, the glory of the Lord shone around them. Of course they're afraid. And the angel message, 10, 11, and 12. You don't need to be afraid. I'm here to give you great news. In fact, look at the news specifically that he gives in verse 11. There's something that often I think gets glossed over. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. We get three titles with three different meanings in this one message from the angel. A Savior has been born. The solution to fix the problem of sin that has been with humanity ever since Adam in the garden. The fix is here. A Savior is born. He is 
Christ, now in Luke, Christ means the anointed one, the promised one. God has recognized that there is a problem with broken humanity, and he has promised over and over and over and over and over again that he would fix the problem. He would send somebody to set everything right. That person is the Christ. A Savior has been born. He is Christ, the Lord. This word, Lord, the word Adonai, is a bit of a clue. Now, Adonai means Lord, ruler, the one who's going to be in charge. Now, there's a neat tradition in reading Hebrew. I don't know if you know this, but if you are reading along in Hebrew and you come across the four-letter name of God written with the letters Yad, He, Vav, He, there are no vowel markings attached to that word. It kind of jumps off the page because of that. You don't know how to pronounce it. And so... You don't. When you learn Hebrew, you are taught that whenever you come to the name of God, you pronounce it, you replace it, I'm sorry, with the word Adonai, which means Lord. In English, we could see that translated, especially in your King James Bibles, capital L, small capitals O-R-D. Have you ever seen that in your Bible? Whenever you come across that spelling in that way, especially in the Old Testament, especially if you have a King James Bible, you are reading the name of God. Luke is letting his readers know that the angel is delivering the ultimate message. God has sent his Savior, his Christ, his Son. All of this, the absolute core of what the gospel is, of who Jesus is, is all in verse 11. Verse 12 says, this is a sign. You're going to be able to find him. You'll know it's him because he's in a feeding trough. Now, that is not a normal place for babies to be placed. We, we've got a grandson on the way. Janica's been setting up her nursery for quite some time. No feeding trough in there. A crib. That's where you expect babies to be laid. But this baby was born in a cattle stall and placed in a trough. He should be easy to find. Just check all the barns in town. We're given verse 13 and 14 to wrap up this section. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. We have in verses 1 to 7, heaven's plan. We have in verses 8 and 9, heaven's witnesses, the shepherds. We have in verses 10 to 12, heaven's interruption, the angel message. And then we see in 13 and 14, heaven's response, the choir. And they show up, and look at what they say. Glory to God in the highest. God is doing this, and humans are to be at peace. Because God notices what you need, and he has sent the solution. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. These first 14 verses in Luke give us heaven's example. And now we're going to skip down a little bit. And we're going to pick up the story. This is eight days after Jesus has been born. God fearing Joseph and Mary, law abiding Jews, observe the custom to take their firstborn baby into the temple and dedicate him to the service of Yahweh on his eighth day. So we pick this up at verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he had seen the Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to be the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul also. How do we respond to Jesus' birth? 
We saw Heaven's example. Now let's look at Simeon's statement. We respond to Jesus' birth looking at Simeon's statement. And his statement is his response. Then there's some very good things that are going on in here. Notice in verse 25, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is on Simeon. He's specifically empowered to serve God. Now, up to this point, the Holy Spirit does not take up permanent residence in or dwell in anyone in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit has rested upon certain individuals to empower them to serve God in specific ways. Numbers 11, 24 and 25 explains this. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took of the Spirit that was on him, Moses, and put the Spirit on the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. So what's Simeon's specific purpose? Frankly, I think it's to speak to us. I think it's to give us an example of how we are to interact with the Spirit. Look at his examples in verses 26 and 27 and 28. The Spirit clued in Simeon, and Simeon's response was to watch. The Messiah's going to show up, and you're going to see it. The Spirit spoke to him, and Simeon listened. The Spirit moved Simeon, and he went. The Spirit helped Simeon see Jesus, and he put it all together. You know, there are lots of people who see Jesus but don't put it all together. Especially at this time of year, they don't respond like Simeon does, and that's the challenge for us. Those of us on whom God's favor has rested, those of us who have recognized that Jesus is Savior and Christ and Lord, we are to have ourselves such a merry little Christmas that people are drawn to him. And look at what Simeon says in verses 29 to 32. He lifts up the baby Jesus and he prays the Lord with this prayer of thanksgiving. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation. Here's a recognition of God's kept promise. Simeon focuses on salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. And here we know that Simeon sees the scope of that salvation. I had to say that phrase really slowly to make sure I got that all in. Simeon sees the scope of salvation, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. Jesus is going to bless everyone on the planet, whoever they may be. And yet, as Simeon prays this prayer and prophecy over Jesus, Mary and Joseph hear it, but they don't fully get it. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. I love the fact that they marvel about this and that they don't get it. Let yourself off the hook, everybody. I know it's really easy to beat myself up for all those times that God is doing a thing and I've missed it. By golly, I'm supposed to be a pastor, Lord. How could I have missed you doing that thing? Mary is the mother of God and she missed it. So have a little grace here for yourself. Do your best to watch like Simeon did, but don't beat yourself up if you happen to not fully understand what God is doing in the moment. The child's father and mother marveled at what Simeon said about Jesus. And then for verses 34 and 35, Simeon blesses them, gives them a specific prayer of blessing. He said to Mary's mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. This is a reminder to Mary, to Joseph, that God is going to be paying attention. You are going to live your normal life. You're going to raise Jesus. You're going to change diapers. You're going to chase after him when he's running around. I imagine that Joseph probably whittled toys for Jesus and then when Jesus got old enough, showed him how to whittle himself. He raised a son. Simeon helps them understand that they're going to help this child grow up, that they're going to be a family. And that might not seem wholly sanctified all the time, but I think it really is. I don't think that's just for the holy family, Jesus, Joseph, Mary. I think Simeon is speaking here for all families, 
yours and mine. Our living, moving, having our being in Christ is an act of sacrifice, of glory, of worship, of showing God that we are willing, when we remember to do it, to enter into this life that's been set apart for God's use. Let me give an example, and this might seem like a strange one. This is from the Apostle Paul in his letter to Philippians. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Now, you could interpret that as, wow, this apostle is thinking of these people all the time. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think what Paul is saying is something closer to, you know, every time God brings you to mind, I stop for a moment and I say, gosh, Lord, thanks for that group of people. I admit, I, Pastor Ed, do not pray for this congregation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But I think of you often, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays. I think of you often, and when I think of you, I thank God for you. When I walk out my front door, what do I see? This building, the meeting house, and that reminds me of all the people who meet in this meeting house. And I thank God for the day, and I thank God for the opportunity to minister here, and I thank God for you. God is paying attention. That's what blessing is. God is going to use Jesus to reveal people's hearts here from verse 35, including the sorrow that Mary is going to experience herself at Jesus' crucifixion. So let me close with this final thought. What is God revealing to you about your heart this holiday? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're getting closer and closer to day one. Closer and closer to the first day of Christmas, the day when everybody tends to recognize this is Christmas itself. And whether I like it or not, I think it's, it's probably true that a lot of people's expression of all of their Christian understanding of faith gets wrapped up in that one day. Atheists and pagans celebrate Christmas. Those you have called to yourself celebrate Christmas. So, Father, help us to see the image of your Son, not just in the season, but in each other, in ourselves, recognizing that the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us if we have come to understand you as Savior and Christ and Lord. Help us to show him to a watching world this season and indeed for the rest of the year. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.